All right, this is chapter five, section two, and we're going to be breaking this into two parts because I feel that Louis the Fourteenth deserves his own <laughs> slideshow, um, and so we're going to be looking at uh, two rulers before we get to Louis the Fourteenth. All right, the first ruler we're looking at is actually. Um, Henry of Navarre, and we spoke about him in class a little bit. Uh, this section is religious wars and power struggles, which is unfortunately a lot of what's going on in France at this time. Um, Henry ascends to the French throne and was never really supposed to. Uh, he becomes king in 1589. Upon doing so, he adopts Catholicism because, if you remember, Henry was actually a Huguenot. He was a French Protestant, and he was married to to um, the daughter of Catherine de' Medici because his family was increasingly powerful and she saw this as a way to uh, bring them into the fold and control them and then you know on their wedding day she had most of his family slaughtered um, through Catherine's death and the resulting deaths of her sons he actually ends up on the throne which I'm sure sent Catherine rolling in her grave um, he does adopt Catholicism, being his famous quote is, Paris is well worth a mass. Um, and um, he really does his best to try to get the country, what we would say, on track. Um, he issues the Edict of Nantes. It's a declaration of religious toleration. And he gives a lot of freedom to French Huguenots to practice their faith and um, defend themselves. He has several um, children with his wife, Marie de' Medici, and um, even though he does his best to maintain peace in France, he is assassinated by a religious fanatic who doesn't like the moderate measures that he was uh, putting in place in 1610, and the guy, like, freaked out, leaped into his carriage and stabbed him to death. All right. That was his wife. <clears throat> she obviously is a fan of the fleur de lis, uh, which is the little gold thing all around her on her dress. Um, their son was only eight when H Henry the Fourth was assassinated. He is Louis the Thirteenth, and so really Louis's mother is running the kingdom, Marie de Medici, and. And she has some help. Um, she has some help from her Italian boyfriend, which really angers French nobles. But she also turns to um, another uh, guy in the French church to help her out. And his name is Cardinal Richelieu. Cardinal Richelieu um, is the advisor, but really, if you if you look at for all practical purposes, he's the one ruling France. And some of the policies that he puts in in place really strengthen the monarchy and allow Louis XIV to have the kind of absolute power that he'll have. It's Cardinal Richelieu who sort of builds that and hands that you know, to him. Um, Cardinal Richelieu goes about uh, increasing the power of the ruling family, which was the Bourbons, by limiting the freedom of the Huguenots. Um, the Huguenots could, at this point, still practice their religion without being uh, penalized or tormented, but they couldn't build cities with walls around them anymore. Uh, Richelieu felt that this was just inviting um, them to plot against the king and to be able to defend themselves against the king's armies. And he didn't like that. He also weakens the power of the nobility in favor of the monarch. He also essentially, just like he tells the Huguenots, no more walled cities, he tells the, um, <clears throat> the uh, nobility, you need to tear down your fortress castles. No one, no one should be able to hide from the king's army. In practice, again, he is the real ruler of France, um, and he has a falling out. He he loses some power um, when Louis's mother loses power because she is f found to be plotting against the king with um, her Italian, you know, boyfriend. Um, but he comes back and mediates a settlement between the king and his mommy. So there's Cardinal Richelieu. That's a real photo of him on the left. And it's it's interesting that he's portrayed standing because that's usually reserved for rulers. So he's definitely sending you a message there. On the right is just an awesome uh, portrayal. <laughs> it's my favorite portrayal of Cardinal Richelieu by Tim Curry in The Three Musketeers. This is an interesting painting, um, not just 
for, you know, everyone's face looks bizarre. And I think that's hair on that kid's head. I'm not sure. But um, what is is most interesting is in the middle there, um, you have the future king, Louis the Fourteenth, And then, of course, holding him up is his mommy. That's Anne of Austria, Queen of France. Um, and then on the other side of him, of course, is his dad, Louis the Thirteenth, with the diabolical sort of mustache. Um, but then looking over Louis the Thirteenth's shoulder is Cardinal Richelieu, and looking over Anne of Austria's shoulder is supposed to be a representation of Marie de' Medici. So they are king and queen of France, but they certainly do not rule for their entire um, time on the thrones. Let's look at what writers were doing during this time. Um, one of the things that comes out of these French wars of religion are, are this idea of skepticism. And it's, the again, the idea that nothing can be known for certain. It sounds awfully Socratic, if you remember the Socratic method. How do you know? How do you know? How do you know? What's for dinner? How do you know? Um, and, you know, after seeing the needless slaughter of people based on religion, um, a lot of people become... Very, again, very skeptical, um, very dismissive of the old ways because is this, you know, massacre and slaughter, is this what we get from the old ways? And you get a lot of doubt that anyone has the answers. Two major writers that you need to know are Montaigne is the first one, and he explores ideas about life's meaning through a new written form, the essay. I know you're thinking, thanks a lot, dude. When a new, um, or well, with this new art form, these short, um, it's not a book, it's not a pamphlet, it's just an essay expressing ideas, you know, you do them in English. Um, and one of the things that, or, or what he really explored is the idea that when a new idea replaces an old idea, everyone accepts the new idea as truth and the old idea as gone. So therefore, the next step is, well, then when you accept this new idea, won't it eventually be replaced as well? And so if it will, how can you know that it's true? You know, the idea that, you know, when something new gets discovered, you'll replace this idea of what you think is true and what you think is best with something that is now better. So can you be certain that it's true? You know, it's like a new iPhone. You think the one you have is awesome and then they come out with another one. All right, another writer is Rene Descartes, and he explored the same ideas. How can we attain certainty? He wrote um, the book Meditations on the First Philosophy, and it is the writings of Rene Descartes that helped create the scientific method, but we'll get into that more when we hit the Enlightenment. Tomorrow, again, is all about the Sun King.